Thank you for joining me today for another episode of the Hunger Hunt Feast. Today, um, I want to share my thoughts on body positivity in the time of COVID. Body positivity has overrun common sense. When we're referring to obese people as healthy or saying it's okay to be obese and not associating with disease or increased vulnerability to disease, we are denying reality. Now, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir on this one, but I think we need to address it openly and frequently. And hopefully some of the studies, um, which will be linked in the show notes, which I'm about to share, will serve as shareable resources for you if you, if you choose to talk about it. Um, the U.S. adult obesity rate was 42.4% in 2017-18, up from 30% in 2000. Now, I've been thinking it was 30, 32 percent because of that 2000 number, 42.4%, up, up over, just over 12% in 17, 18 years. Wow, that's quite a climb. How long before we hit 50%? Another 10 years, maybe? 2028, maybe 2030, 50% obesity. You, you, it sounds like a number that we just, it can't be possible, but it, we're seeing that it is. We've gone from 30 to 42 in just 18 years. Worldwide obesity in 2016 was about 13%. So we're, we're over triple the world average. Hello, most, you know, economically successful country with the, the best medical care available. Yeah, I mean, every opportunity available. 42% obesity. Now, for adults, the WHO defines overweight and obesity as follows. So overweight is a BMI greater than or equal to 25. Obesity is a BMI greater than or equal to 30. They often are referred to morbidly obese as a BMI of 35 or greater. Now, is BMI perfect? No. But we need a standard of some kind. And uh, since we're, we seem to be losing standards by the minute these days, um, let's try to hang on to this one just for now, okay? Yes, you can be muscular and have a BMI over 25, just be a muscular, lean, athletic person and, and have a BMI over 25 that would put you in the overweight category. That would, that would refer to me as well, okay? Mine, mine's currently 26. It can push up to 27, uh, but at 6'2", with weight fluctuating 205 to 208 right now, sometimes 210. Um, yeah, I'm, according to BMI, I'm overweight. I'm overweight. So that's the flaw because I'm pretty lean. You know, I don't have excess fat, and supposed to, that's what that's supposed to be referring to. But that's not really the case for most people. If you're one of those people, obviously, BMI is not referring to you, is it? Because it is an old standard. Um, but, you know, a set body fat percentage would be better. Um, but an accurate measurement of that is a little harder to come by for now. Um, but a BMI of 30 or more, generally speaking, is likely an obese person or at least very overweight. And it's too high. Um, and to clarify, this is not about shaming people. Okay, being overweight is a state of health, not a judgment on your personal value as a human. Being obese doesn't make anyone unlovable or unable to contribute to their family or their community. But let's be honest and not say it's a healthy state. Okay, it, it needs to change. It's a state that needs to change. It's not okay to be obese. It's a diseased state of health. Now, let's get to the kids. That's good too. 20% of kids age 6 to 11 in the U.S. are obese. One in five kids age 6 to 11 obese. That should be a low single-digit number. And, and it was not that long ago. 21% 20, of teenagers 
or obese. So that's ages 12 to 19. So a little more than one in five, but about one in five. That's crazy. So we are not only growing that direction with our adults, but we are, we are, it's beginning with the kids. It's beginning at a very young age. And we are <clears throat> proliferating this behavior, aren't we? In 2008, the medical cost of obesity in the US was $147 billion. That's billion with a B, billion. That affects everyone, obese or not. Healthcare costs at that magnitude, they affect in health insurance premiums, affect medical costs, they, they affect uh, <laughs> you know, the, the amount of people in the hospital, right? Uh, that affects everyone, $147 billion cost. That was 13 years ago. Worldwide, obesity has tripled since 1975. 1975. Now correlate that with something. Let's correlate the tripling of obesity with maybe something that happened close to around 1975. I don't know. How about the war on dietary fat, on saturated fat? Right? The food guide pyramid, the food pyramid, right? Our, our current nutrition guidelines, which have adjusted a little over the last... <laughs> I don't know, 40 plus years, not much, not enough. We're still waging war on saturated fat. Um, we're still people selling statins because and telling people not to eat eggs because uh, cholesterol, dietary cholesterol is supposed to be bad and cause heart disease. We're still waging this war, telling people not to eat meat. Let's reduce meat intake. Really? You correlate that. 1975, food pyramid came out in 78, official nutrition guidelines a couple of years later. Hmm. Hmm. Coincidence? Hmm. Look, you can't catch obesity like a virus, can you? It doesn't develop like cancer or heart disease where you can't see it or predict it. You can see it happening. It's pretty obvious, you know, when you're overweight. You know we need to lose weight. And if you're obese, it's pretty obvious. It's blatantly obvious. Something has to change. There's something wrong. It's not supposed to be that way. And it is self-inflicted, like uh, alcoholism, drug addiction. Now, you may have a genetic predisposition, but that is affected by epigenetics, right? It's lifestyle choices engaging with your genes, turning on genes that might predispose you to some insulin resistance or some, you know, to weight gain. We're not all built the same. We're not all meant to look the same. We can look at athletes and see different body types, right? Professional athletes, Olympic athletes, see different body types. Some people are thicker than others. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an excess body fat and anybody can have that. Some people have an easier time getting there than others, but obesity is obesity. Is it ethical or honest to tell an alcoholic that their addiction is okay because it makes them more fun, makes them a fun person, makes them the life of the party, makes everybody else feel, you know, kind of like laugh and, and joke and feel lighthearted because they're around and drunk often? Or is it okay to excuse their behavior because they are a kind, lovable person? No, that's called denial. That's called Enabling, isn't it? Now, we all have our weaknesses that we need to work on and prove ourselves, right? We all have participated in self-destructive activities and, and sometimes even made them habits. But we don't canonize those bad habits as normal or, or okay, or and certainly don't call them healthy. There's nothing positive about being obese. It's not okay to accept that as your perpetual state. Obesity is directly linked to heart disease, cancer, type two diabetes, fatty liver disease, hypertension. And now 
COVID-19. Across multiple countries, it's the leading comorbidity along with type 2 diabetes and hypertension, which those are hand in hand related, right? If you're obese, you, you're, if you're not type 2 diabetic, you're on your way, probably hypertensive. Um, that's in, you know, after age, it's the leading comorbidity, right? After being over, over 70, right? I, I saw a pic on social media with a commentary from a mother referring to her healthy, air quote, healthy, 16 year old daughter with COVID who was wearing a, a, a sort of ma oxygen mask trying to get air. And, and she was suffering for sure. COVID, very sick. Um, but this healthy 16 year old daughter was every bit of 100 pounds overweight, morbidly obese, without question. Uh, so using the sympathy. For COVID, now having COVID and having that severe symptom from COVID is a terrible thing. No question. It's terrible. And it's, 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 it's terrible that this 16 year old is suffering that way. But using that to make the case that healthy young people are more, are, are still very susceptible to COVID too. Like, I mean, that's just, um, it's dishonest for one, it's, it's delusional. It's a denial of reality. Um, you, you know, this is not a healthy 16 year old. This is an obese, the story should be this obese 16 year old has COVID. And then take that to, you know, obviously obesity makes you more susceptible to COVID, which everyone looking at the picture can see, but the caption, healthy 16 year old daughter, to project an agenda, to project a narrative. Now, as a parent, uh, my opinion, this is neglect. It's enabling the obesity, the obesity. Because this parent is probably supplying, like any parent of an obese child, is probably supplying the food. And it's abusive. This codependent mother who can't tell her child no is killing her. Because I'm guessing a 16 year old can't supply all her food and shelter and, and, and life expenses, right? And if this mother's telling her, you know, referring to her as healthy while supplying her food and she's over 100 pounds of her weight, it was obvious it was morbidly obese, let's just stick with that. That's abusive. And, and definitely, you know, uh, the mother bears some responsibility for this child's health. Okay. So now, instead of the slow death that obesity often is, with COVID, it can be a much quicker one. Does that sound harsh? I think vaccine mandates of any kind are harsh. I think mask mandates for kids are harsh especially for disease with a 99.9, .9, fill in the number, percent survival rate for people under 70. Yeah. Leveraging a bad COVID outcome of an already diseased person to justify mandatory vaccinations in workplaces, in schools, or uh, justify a universal vaccination campaign including the latest push toward vaccinating children, not just teenagers, but even kids under 12. This is criminal. It's greed. It's medical malpractice. In my opinion, it's assault. So here's a question for you. Why is Bill Maher the only person on national television who has mentioned that 78% of the people who have died from COVID are obese? Or that 40% of the people with type COVID have type 2 diabetes. Now, I'm not a fan of Bill Moore by any stretch. I generally disagree with everything he says, but lately he seems to be the only one on national TV making much sense. Well, he's one of the few, but he's the only one I've heard ask that question and openly correlate uh, 
you know, obesity and diabetes with death from COVID, asking, asking, why aren't we hearing this from health authorities? Why aren't we hearing this from the federal government, which has taken such a strong, forceful hand in managing our lives with this? Why has nothing been mentioned about obesity and diabetes and personal health and, and responsibility in that area? Like all the responsibility seems to be on vaccines and mandates, not uh, uh, vaccine mandates and, and mass mandates, not on uh, your personal health. In fact, there's been the denial of the effect of food choices on, on health, on immunity, on whether or not you get COVID. Then, then he asks another great question. He said it sarcastically, but yet you kind of have to give it some weight. Are they afraid of offending Pepsi? Is that why they haven't mentioned it? Is that why he's saying, why haven't anyone mentioned this? Why he's asking, why hasn't anyone brought this up from our health authorities, from the federal government? Are they afraid of offending Pepsi? Are they afraid of offending their donors? Are they afraid of offending people who sponsor and send money to the USDA and Nutrition Academy and I mean, you know, these big food companies, they know who to send money to, to make sure they are, you know, the, the agenda, everything is kept status quo, nothing changes. The messaging stays the same. Hmm. Now there have been recent studies about UK, France, Spain, and China, uh, about the increased risk of obese for hospitalization and death uh, with COVID. We saw this early on in Italy and then, of course, in, in New York. We saw that, uh, those numbers coming out. Um, and we have some idea why. There's a study and an article I'll link to in the show notes, basically asking what, you know, or showing what makes obese, the obese host so vulnerable to this virus. And as I said before, being obese appears to be this, the greatest single risk factor after age. And looking at the data from hospitals um, of the patients admitted into intensive care, which are usually put on ventilators, 75% uh, of those were obese, of the patients admitted. 75% were obese. Close to 90% of the patients with a BMI over 35 required ventilation. So they have BMI over 35, 90% of the people who were, who were COVID patients with a BMI over 35, so that's not more of the obese number, required ventilation. 90%, that's a significant number. It's a correlation, but it's a significant one. Considering this, this has a 99.9 something percent uh, you know, survival rate for most people. You know, so there was a larger study of over 3,600 patients with, uh, with, pa with COVID who were under 60 years old. Um, patients with a BMI over 30, so that's, that's the obese number. Patients with a BMI over 30 were more than twice as likely to be admitted with severe disease or severe symptoms with COVID. With a BMI over 35, so the morbidly obese, they were 3.6 times more likely to be admitted to the ICU. And this data is coming from New York, UK, France, Italy, Spain, China, Mexico, and Germany. They all found a significant association between BMI and severe de disease or death from COVID. That's a pretty good grouping of uh, countries. The UK study looked at over 16,000 hospitalized patients. Um, in China, they looked at a group of COVID patients with uh, metabolically associated fatty liver disease, MAFLD. So in other words, not alcoholic uh, associated liver disease, but it's metabolically associated fatty liver disease. 
68% uh, of those patients, COVID patients with MAFLD were overweight and had a BMI over 25, 68%. So fatty liver. So out of the overweight, of those that were the overweight, um, 37% had severe disease, severe disease. Out of that, the 68% were overweight. Out of those, that grouping, 37% of them had severe disease. Only about 9% of the non-obese had severe disease. That's a significant difference. The mechanisms for this are, are many. There's chronic inflammation from increased cytokine in an obese person. Um, you have impaired immunity, disrupted lymphoid tissue, which affects the T cell activity, right? So disrupted lymph tissue affects the T cells. Uh, the insulin resistance and leptin resistance impairs immune function. You have increased thrombosis thrombosis, excuse me, which is the blood clotting that's common in obese people. And blood clotting, we see that as being an issue with both COVID and the accompanying vaccines. Um, so here's, here's something, you may have heard a little bit about this, but the ACE2 receptors, uh, which are part of um, giving the virus entrance to the cell. That's how the cell enters, or the virus enters the cell through the ACE2 receptor. ACE2 receptors are, are very uh, prevalent in fat tissue, adipose tissue, even more so than in the lungs. And that's where, you know, they're saying it was, you know, gets access to the lungs through the ACE2 receptors. More ACE2 receptors are far more present in fat tissue or adipose tissue than the lungs. So the more fat you have, the more ACE2 receptors you have, the greater access into your cells by the virus. And funny, we're seeing more and more cases of vaccinated people getting COVID, aren't we? And it's pointing at it also to the, oh, it's a new variant. Oh, it's this, it's this. Now, we know from the CDC's own study that vaccinated people carry just as much of the virus and are just as able to spread the virus as unvaccinated. We know that, that, that came out at the end of July. 2021 year. Um, and studies are showing that the new variants appear to be resistant to the uh, spike protein vaccines, the current vaccines. However, obesity as an independent risk factor of, uh, of severity is still seems to hold true. So the vaccines are vaccinated, unvaccinated, doesn't matter. You can still catch it, you still spread it. Obesity is still an independent risk factor of severity. We have, I think, the majority of the U.S. Not the world, of course, but you know we've got most of the vaccines here, so we've got a large portion of our population vaccinated. Obesity and a large portion of our, uh, almost as large portion, but forty-two percent are obese. And obesity is still the independent risk factor of severity. Okay, 42% obese, let's say we got 50 something percent, maybe maybe close to 60% vaccinated. And that number's about to go up as they, as they uh, make that requirement for federal employees. Um, so we have most of the country vaccinated, we have 42% obese. Obesity is an infinite risk factor for severity, death. Just what if, I'm spitballing here, just, just kind of, you know, playing with some numbers, just, just, or just looking at, you know, maybe some correlation, if you want to call it that. Um, what if obesity or just being overweight, okay? Just having an excessive amount of body fat had a greater impact on whether someone uh, that was exposed to COVID had severe disease than whether or not they were vaccinated wouldn't that be an interesting study to compare 
the numbers on severity of disease with obesity versus vaccination status. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure who would fund it since you've been alienating both the processed food industry and the pharmaceutical industry. So I'm not, there may not be any money left after those two are, are out of the picture. Um, Cause they, you know, they fund the USDA and the FDA. Yeah, not likely to get funded by that, right? Um, so who knows who would fund that one? We might be able, someone really smart might be able to pull those numbers together. At least come up with a correlation study, just throwing that out there in case if you statisticians out there bored want something to do. Um, now we've all heard that the Pfizer vaccine offers a risk reduction, right? The risk reduction of the Pfizer vaccine, 95%. And Moderna, the Moderna vaccine offers a risk reduction of 94%. However, so that sounds pretty good, right? It sounds like, wow, that really reduces a lot of risk, 95%, 94%. I don't know, Zane. I don't know, maybe obesity, you know, that, was, that wasn't quite to that, you know, not really increased risk that much, did it? Well, kind of. Well, let's, let's look a little closer at these stats here. Keyword left out of those risk reduction stats. It's the word relative. When you put relative in with risk reduction, it changes, it can change the definition of it. Relative risk reduction, as opposed to an absolute risk reduction. What's the difference? Some of you know this, because I've mentioned it before, with meat, so forth. Uh, meat, cancer and meat, absolute versus relative risk. So relative risk reduction is how much risk is reduced in an experimental group compared to the control group. So it's a risk reduction between the two groups. You have the group that's the, that gets the treatment, the treatment group, and you have a group that's the control group. They might get a placebo or nothing or whatever, you know, they get nothing, but they don't get the treatment. So they're the control group. I'm in the control group in this instance, personally. Uh, nationwide control group, you know, you know what I'm saying. But anyway, it's a comparison between the experiment group and the control group. And I'll explain that a little deeper. The, but first, the absolute risk reduction is the absolute difference in the outcomes between one group, usually the control group, and the group receiving the treatment. Now that sounds, doesn't sound too different, does it? Okay, so let me reword that. The per, this percentage tells you how much the risk of something happening decreases if a certain intervention happens. So what's the percentage, what, how much risk, what's the percentage of risk does it decrease if you get the treatment versus if you don't get the treatment? Okay, so I realize, see these, these are used with studies when someone's trying to sell something they are, these, these terms are thrown around a bit because most people, including even people in the medical industry, are not gonna really understand how different these are. And from the definitions, it may not be super clear. So I'm gonna give you some examples to help you, to, to clarify it. Cause that's what I did when I first understood, started understanding relative risk versus um, absolute risk. So again, relative risk is a, is a reduction of change in risk the difference in risk between the control group and the treatment group. The absolute risk reduction is the decrease in risk between the control group and the treatment group. So the Pfizer's, remember, remember I said the, the relative risk reduction for, for Pfizer was 95% and Moderna it was 95%. Well, the absolute risk reduction for Pfizer is actually 0.7%. That's not 70. 0.7, as in less than 1%. The Moderna absolute risk reduction is actually 1.1%. So if you get the treatment, your reduced risk of it happening decreases by 0.7% for Pfizer. Decreases by 1.1% for Moderna. Say what? That doesn't sound like a big risk reduction to me, especially considering the risk of the possible risk of an experimental vaccine, right? So 
if you click on the link in the show notes and look at the study, there's an image, there's a couple images there that will kind of help you see this if you want a visual. I recommend it if you really want to look at this. It, it really, it really um, clarifies it, but I'm going to try to do my best to explain it here verbally. Um, let's say you have two groups with 100 people in each group. Now, that was not this group. Okay? This was not this experiment, but this is just a, using numbers for an example to, to show the difference in relative risk and absolute risk. Okay, So 100 people in each group, a treatment group and a placebo group or a control group, right? 100 in each. If two people in the control group get COVID, one person in the control in the in the treatment group gets COVID. So two people in the control group or the non-treatment group get COVID, and then one person in the treatment group gets COVID. So you got two, no treatment, one out of 100 with treatment. The relative risk reduction is 50%. Right, because one is 50% of two. Is that really what you want to know when you're just trying to decide whether you want a treatment? Does that sound significant to you? Instead of two out of 100, it was one out of 100, and you want to know that was a 50% risk reduction. 50% risk reduction sounds like a lot more than just one extra person out of 100, doesn't it? The absolute risk reduction in that case is 1%, very similar to. Uh, Moderna, which is 1.1. Greater, that's actually a greater risk reduction than Pfizer vaccine. And these are, this is their numbers. This is Pfizer's numbers. It's Moderna's numbers. This is, okay. Hmm, not so impressive, is it? 50% risk reduction because it's two to one. 50% one is less than 50% of two. So that control group, 50% risk reduction but it was one person out of 100 difference. And we know one out of 100 is 1%. So 1% real, real life, real case scenario. You're in a group of 100 people. One person instead of two. Now I'll tell you that, do they? So they often report relative risk reduction. I said they want to sell a drug or they want to demonize a product like a little meat, right? Um, that's how they sold statins. Uh, so they had several statin trials. They used the relative risk reduction, like the ASCOT LLP, which is a uh, lipid lowering trial. They had 10,000 people. Um, uh, 10,000 people, people give them the placebo or the control group. Okay, 3.3% had a heart attack. In the treatment group or the statin treated group, 1.9% had a heart attack. Well, some quick math will tell you that's a risk reduction or a reduction of, of those who had a heart attack versus, you know, in, in one group versus the other. Uh, so control versus treatment of 1.4%, right? So it's a reduction of 1.4%. That doesn't sound super impressive to me. But that's your absolute risk reduction for taking that statin. That's out of 10,000 people. So that's probably a pretty good indicator. But the relative risk reduction that they use to sell the statin is actually 36%. <laughs> some quick math, a uh, little division there, and you'll get your your 36, uh, get your 36 percent, 3.3 divided into 1.9, 36 percent relative risk reduction. Well, that sounds significant. Oh, relative risk reduction, to, a, rel a risk reduction of 36 percent when the, the real numbers are you had 1.9 percent. One, actually, excuse me, 1.4% reduced risk in real terms. Eating processed meat, that was a big one, Ep an epidemiological study of all things. Um, they, 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 they say every 50 grams uh, of processed meat eaten, okay, so like bacon, hot dogs, candy, you know, sausage, ham, that kind of stuff, 
increase the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. Oh my gosh, every 50 grams is like five slices of bacon, right? Or the equivalent of meat, whatever. And again, this is not talking about steak, chicken legs, roast, stuff like that, right? It's we're talking about processed meat, but they're saying 18% increased risk of colorectal cancer for every 50 grams of meat. That's like an ounce and a half. Like I said, it's, it's actually maybe it's a little bit more than that. It's not, it's not a lot. About five slices of bacon, right? But 18% is the relative risk reduction. In other words, relative to the existing risk of cancer if you don't eat the 50 grams of processed meat daily. So the U.S. average rate of colon cancer is 5%. If the 18, okay, so the 18% relative risk, if you ate your 50 grams of bacon, would move you to 6%. So average rate of colon cancer is 5%. To you eat your 50 grams of bacon, it's 6% get colon cancer if you're eating the processed meat every day. So the absolute risk is a 1% increase. 1%. 18% sounds a lot more marketable attention grabbing, doesn't it? it? Increases your risk by 1%, but 18% is what makes the headlines. On top of that, it's a correlation study. These were RCTs, you know, <laughs> with the, with the, um, I'm guessing, yeah, because they had a placebo group and a, you know, control group or a placebo control group that got a placebo, okay? So they didn't know they weren't getting it versus a, um, a, a group, a treatment group. What's a correlation study with questionnaires? Like how much meat do you eat? How often do you eat it? And then look at their health history. Correlation study. It's like, you got a correlation study and 1% difference. It's not even, it's not so, it's so insignificant. It's not even worth mentioning, let alone, it's not even enough to justify an RCT. If you have a huge amount of risk or correlation show up in a correlation study, then it could justify an RCT. This is 1% in a correlation study is, is nothing. That's like the, the, right, the margin of error is greater than that. It's not, it's, but yet they, so they take 18% and make a marketing campaign out of it. So back to COVID, back to COVID, to my bunny trail, but I just want to make the point of relative risk to absolute risk and how it's being related and what it really means. We all now know that these vaccines don't keep us from getting COVID, don't we? We see that over and over. We see it in the studies. We see it in the news. We see it from people we know who are getting breakthrough cases. Countries around the world, we're seeing it. So the absolute risk numbers are actually consistent. The 1% risk and the 0.7% risk reduction. That makes more sense. That kind of makes me wonder um, if they even really reduce symptoms though, doesn't it? They don't, Cause they don't have a 95% restriction of, of keeping you from getting it. Cause we're seeing people get it. It's the 1% that probably don't get it. Um, so do they really reduce symptoms? Do we really know that? What percentages are we using for that? What kind of studies really show that they reduce symptoms? They did, first we were told they would keep you from getting it and keep you from spreading it. That's not true. Do they really reduce symptoms? Or could the increased risk of severe COVID really lie more with, I don't know, a high BMI, being overweight or obese? Could that really be a much more significant factor in symptoms? That's what we're seeing with the increased rate of ventilation, ICU, and entrance, death. There was a study I saw last August, August 2020, that actually spoke about in one episode, I'm not sure what it was, um, posted about it, but it was a st strong correlation of visceral fat hospitalization. So that would have also been that metabolically associated fatty liver disease, that's visceral fat, right? So we were already seeing it then a year ago, strong correlation of visceral fat to hospitalization, ICU, ventilation. This is, this is there's a consistency with this, much more so than with whether or not the vaccine to keep you from getting it. Now, time will tell. Now, how long it takes, who knows? Especially since our health authorities aren't even bringing it up. Um, they're too busy selling a universal vaccination plan. 
despite that, again, the vaccinated are still getting and spreading COVID, just like the unwashed heathens of the unvaccinated. Um, now, if you felt the need to be vaccinated for COVID because you are in a high risk group or your job or education required it, I am sympathetic. I'm not being critical of you or your choice to get the vaccine at all. It's your age, if a, if a, if a autoimmune disease, or you're just, you're, 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 even if you're obese, you, you, you know, you probably need to do whatever you can to keep yourself from getting it, right? And that's your choice. It's available for you to choose. It should be everyone's choice, is my point. It should be everyone's choice, not anyone's mandate. Too many have been convinced or scared into getting it because of misleading information, also known as fraud, right? Much like what we just discussed. They're getting wrong information regarding vaccines. We're not getting information regarding lifestyle, effect of, of your personal current metabolic health. A healthy immune system is still the best defense to all illness, either viral or the chronic lifestyle disease, right? And we saw this in a recent study out of Israel. Uh, they've seen the double vaccinated up to 13 times more likely to be infected or reinfected, really, than if you have natural immunity from a previous infection, but you're, you're unvaccinated. And vaccinated people are up to 27 times more likely to have symptoms than the previously infected, have severe symptoms or have, have a symptomatic case than the previously infected. So if you had it, and you've got the T cells, but you haven't had the vaccine, you're in a much better place than someone who has not had it but they have the vaccine. So, and I say up to because that was within a time constraint of a three month period between getting it and getting vaccinated. So, whether there was a the three month time period in that study, but without time constraints. So, if there's no time constraints or no limited uh, period, uh, putting the, um, when someone was infected to the, uh, the vaccination. Okay. So it's six, you're six times, the double, the vaccinated are six times more likely to be infected than if you have natural immunity from a previous infection. And they're seven times more likely to have a symptomatic case than the previously infected alone. So again, this isn't about having a beach body or how you look in your skinny jeans. It's, it's not about whether you're a good person who can contribute to society. Obesity is a disease state, which makes you more susceptible to other diseases. And if we take the same perspective that many are expressing about unvaccinated people, right? We know what that is. We know what they're saying about unvaccinated people. Then we could say that the large number of obese people in our country, the 42.4% and those who are getting COVID, those, those obese people in our country with that same logic are proliferating COVID-19 more than the people of normal weight with the BMI under 25. Whoa. Hmm. Seem like an extreme position. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to go shouting at an obese person that they're spreading COVID because they're obese. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, you know. However, considering the current narrative, that the, this is a disease of the unvaccinated. This is, this is being spread by unvaccinated. These people are criminal. They are, uh, they need to have rights and privileges 
controlled, limited, yet we see spreading and, you know, the infection and spreading from vaccinated. However, the most common, most independent risk factor, right? Commonly independent risk factor beyond age for being, for severe cases is obesity. So I, I don't think I'm out of line to say that it's possible that obese people who are having severe diseases are, because they're obese, they're more susceptible to it. We see the mechanism for it are proliferating COVID-19 more than people, not alone, but more than people in normal weight. Maybe more so than people who haven't had the vaccine since we're, again, we're not seeing much difference there between vaccine and unvaccinated. Now, if you're overweight and your weight is moving in the wrong direction, in other words, increasing, you need to change your eating habits and, and consistently. Like you're gonna to have to be very consistent and have a very good plan uh, to really change the direction there because hormonally you're not in a great place. Uh, but but you need to change it, right? This is not, again, it's not something you have to deal with down the road, it's something you deal with now because you are more susceptible to this disease. And if this is something that comes, if COVID is something that concerns you, then your weight should concern you and your eating habits should concern you, your lifestyle habits should concern you. And you're, again, you're going to have to be consistent about what you do in order to really make a change. It's not going to happen next week, is it? You know that, because you probably tried to before. And I'm sympathetic to that. I help people do that. It's not a sales pitch. I truly understand it's not easy to change your lifestyle. It's not easy to change what's going on in your body hormonally to change the direction there once you're already there, especially if you're diabetic. It's extremely difficult. It could take a year or two or three, it could take a long time. However long it takes, it's worth it for a number of reasons, for a number of the, the problems and diseases that, that associated with, that come from what's driving your obesity, because that's all hormonally driven, metabolically hormonal, okay, driven, metabolically hormonally driven, okay? you have to change where you're going. You have to change the direction of your life in this area, the sooner the better. If the last year and a half hasn't convinced you of that, I honestly don't know what will. Have a good week.